but we start with understanding the maintenance function. And what one can one can try and understand the maintenance function in a variety of ways. You can you can look at it from different angles, and you can uh, use different tools to understand what goes on in maintenance. The the one that I prefer. Uh, that I believe that communicates very well what happens in the maintenance field uh, in practice is that of maintenance models. Maintenance models. So you have different people and groups in the world that has uh, developed some models of how do they understand the maintenance field. And uh, it is wonderful to look at these various perspectives because different people also look differently at the major function. They look at it from different angles. And it's good to see it from, from the various angles. And then start understanding and start in, in, integrating all these different, different views of maintenance into one. So we start with a, with a little bit of background. Uh, we say that maintenance is one of the organization's main functions. Now, uh, I, I think that's fairly clear. Uh, the typical industrial organization uh, has to produce things to sell or to, uh, yeah, to sell or to provide to, to parent organizations in the case of mining very often. Uh, but they produce, and then in the process of producing, they have equipment that they need for the production process and that and the equipment needs to be maintained, needs to be uh, preserved in some other way. So, and, and that is maintenance's function. As such, maintenance needs to practice sound strategic management. So, uh, uh, maintenance needs to understand very well what are their strategic role in the business and uh, they have to sort of, of translate that strategic goal of, of theirs into some uh, solid strategic uh, goals and, and plans and so on. Maintenance models are also one of the primary means of doing so. In other words, of either, even understanding the business strategically. And you will see as we go along that that's a very important angle of maintenance models. Maintenance people right over the globe started developing such models over the last 50 years. And maybe even a little bit longer than 50 years. So you, you will get some rudimentary models earlier than that. Uh, Let's go back and let's, let's look at the, uh, at, at the foundation of, on which they are based. Most of these models are based on the principles of strategic management and the principles of control theory. Now, control theory plays a very important role in, in any man management system. Uh, not only uh, maintenance management, any management system uh, one could understand much better by using control theory. Uh, now, a control model, a simple control model, typically has an input, something that you want to achieve. It has an output, what, what it actually achieves. Uh, it has a process for achieving that input. That input is, in other words, a standard that you want to get to. And you then measure the output and you compare that against the, the input, the, the standard that you've set, and you make changes into the process. You, you apply corrective action to the process. So as to ensure that the process eventually gets the required result. That's, that's what you want to achieve. So, let's look at this. Uh, in a, in a simple technical example. My car has an, an speed control. What do I do? I tell the speed control that I want to drive at a certain speed. I have some way of telling it that. 
So now it has a stand, it has an input. It has a process through which it controls the speed, normally by opening and closing the, the accelerator. Uh, and it, has, it, it results in an output which is measured by some means. Something nowadays electronically will measure exactly what is the speed. It will then compare that, that speed against the, the standard that you gave it and it will then change the position of the accelerator pedal or, or, what, or whatever means it uses to, to, to do the control. So that's a simple example of a technical control system. What is very important in such a control system is that it should not react too fast or too slow. In other words, we, we, we talk of the damping of such a, a control system and we say, well, it, it must not overdamp because if it overdamps, it, it, it makes for it that, that, you, that you don't have proper uh, Changes, the changes are damped such that, that you don't have a control system anymore. You have sort of a, a system that always must work at that one speed. It, 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 it damps the reaction of, of the thing. But on the other hand, it must not overcompensate. In other words, it must not overcompensate if it reacts too much. What then happens is that in the speed control case, it will open up the accelerator too much and the car will accelerate to too high a speed and then it will close it down too much again and you will get sort of a, and you can even get a very unstable situation if that is over that. So it must be somewhere you, you talk of critical damping, the type of damping that is acceptable in that situation. Okay. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a management system of course the same thing. What happens in a management system is that you want to achieve something you have a process through which you achieve it. You, 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 you have an, a management information system, or in our case, then a computerized maintenance management system that gives you some reports back, tells you something, uh, and based on that, you then make a change. And that change normally in a management system uh, is done by, by, by a person. So somebody in the organization decides that we must make a change or we must not make a change, whatever. Uh, and again, uh, you can make too much of a change and then you can get unstableness in the organization. Or you can cannot make a change when you need to make a change and then of course this stuff just runs away because it, it, it does not it's measured, it's measured and somebody compares it, but even while the output is much different to what, what was suggested in the input, nothing is done. And, and of course that, that means that you, that you can just as well take the measurement away. Then you have a, a control system that does not have feedback. So effective feedback is very important in the control system. Okay, so as we say, most of these models are based on, on the principles of control theory as well. So let's look at uh, some, some strategic management principles. Uh, and we work from, I see it's not shown here, but we work from a resource uh, which is shown on the next slide, uh, strategic management notes by Fred are David. It's the twelfth edition of that of that book, Strategic Management Notes. So we're working from that here. Uh, so the strategic planning, planning process, he says, is that you you have something that tells you what is your mission, what 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 is what are you trying to achieve in terms of the general organisation, or in this case, in terms of of the management of your maintenance of your equipment. What, what are the mission that you want to achieve? And, and following from the mission, you then say, well, what are my objectives? What, 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 what do I need to do? What do I need to, to achieve 
in order to achieve my mission. Because one could also call your mission, you could also call your chief objective, your main objective. And then you look into the environment and you see what, in what way can the environment, the things surrounding your organization, how can they influence, how can they influence the, the situation? And then from that, your mission and objectives and your environmental scanning information, you then formulate your strategy. You eventually go and you implement the strategy and then eventually you must again evaluate and control uh, what, what you've set as a strategy. Because the strategy can of course be wrong as well, in the extremes it can be wrong. Uh, but the strategy can also, your, your objectives that you've set and that you've done might not get to your strategy, so it must, might be impractical uh, and so on. It might be a variety of things. So what we say here in terms of strategic management principles, we say strategic management can be defined as the art and science of formulating, implementing, evaluating cross-functional decisions that enable an organization to achieve its objectives. So that is what this guy, that is really one of the gurus in the, in the strategy field, says what uh, the definition is. Or the science of formulating, implementing, and evaluating decisions. Decisions, cross-functional, meaning that they are cross-functions, in our case, it may be not so cross-functional because we're talking specifically of the maintenance function. Uh, decisions that enable an organization to achieve its objectives. And we want to, the organization to achieve its objectives in terms of the fact that we want to support the maintenance of the equipment so well that the equipment makes for the organization achieving its objectives. So, that's what we want to achieve. Now we say that the strategy management process consists of three stages. And we have the three stages here, we have uh, uh, stage one, uh, we talk of strategy formulation, and yes, the, the reference at the bottom here. Uh, so strategy formation includes developing a vision and a mission. Uh, that's what we have on the, on the diagram the left hand side of the previous slide, uh, identifying an organization's external opportunities and threats, that's what we did with the environmental scanning, determining its internal strengths and weaknesses, and then based on, on the external opportunities, in other words, things that you can, that you can use uh, outside of the organization that you can that you can, you can, you can uh, devise strategies that will ensure that you make optimal use of these opportunities. In other words, that whatever you do is in line with those opportunities, you make use of the opportunities, and where there are things that are bad towards you, threats in the outside world, you, you make sure that you have some things in place that ensure that those threats will get at you. And, and you make use of your, your own internal strengths and your own internal weaknesses. You try to build on your strengths. You try to, to alleviate your, your weaknesses. To get rid of them if you can. Or otherwise, just live with them. But, but make sure that your strategies are such that the weaknesses don't get at you too much. Then you establish long-term objectives and you generate alternative strategies uh, based on, 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 on the th your vision and mission and based on all of this you then establish the long-term objectives that will ensure that you get the best out of your organization best for your organization in terms of maintenance and you generate alternative strategies for that and then eventually you choose the particular strategies to pursue now, of course, we're not talking maintenance detail here, yeah, we're more talking the process, the general process. So we said, 
we do said here that we talk here of strategy form for formulation. That's the first stage, strategy formulation. Our second stage is then strategy implementation. So if we now implement strategy, we say what that requires. It requires a firm to establish annual objectives. Uh, I don't think that sentence is absolutely right. Uh, I think that must probably be a firm resolve to, to establish annual objectives or something like that. Uh, and devise policies and motivate employees, uh, develop a strategy supportive culture and allocate the resources such that formulated strategies can be executed. In other words, what we say is one must be, in order to implement strategy, your mindset must be that you want to make sure that you will establish annual objectives because that is the the making a life of the strategies. If you set annual objectives and you then do them, uh, and then together with that, the firm resolve to establish annual objectives, you should uh, devise policies that are in line with that. Policies are the sort of strategy where strategy is sort of the, what you want to achieve. The policies is, are more of the detail of, of the one that you want to achieve. Uh, and you motivate your employees, very important, otherwise nothing will, will, will happen as it should happen. Uh, you develop a strategy supportive culture, in other words, a, a business culture that, that sort of supports the strategy that you've set. Uh, because if people are negative towards your strategy, then your strategies are just one matter. Uh, and you allocate resources so that your formulated strategies can be executed. In other words, you make sure that the money and uh, all the other resources, uh, uh, labor resources, management resources, and so on, uh, are available to ensure that the <coughs> strategy is, is achieved. Sir? Yes. On that point on, strategy, uh, on developing a strategy supportive culture, You'll find that in the industry, the company is always introducing new things, such that to a point where the employees, they get um, fatigued, they, they have initiative fatigue, there's always a new initiative, there's always a new drive. Wouldn't this work for a new firm, rather than established firms where people already feel like they know what they're supposed to do and then this new initiatives are just there to disrupt them and then they will only make noise about them for three months and after that they die out and they go back to what they do. Yeah. Well, uh, let's say uh, the one thing that an organization should have is an organization should have a strategy for maintenance. Many organizations, in many organizations, those strategies are there but they are informal. In other words, they, they are not formalized and immediately when you have an informal uh, strategy, it means that not everybody in the organization understands it at the same level. It's, it's, uh, if, you, if you ask the, the, the boss of maintenance what, what is the strategy that you, you're having and you ask the level below him and the level below them, you will probably get different answers. And of course, that, that means that you effectively do not have a strategy. So, uh, the, the, the point is that one must, at some stage, you must formalize that strategy. Uh, very often you find in organizations that the, the strategy that they have is not sufficient for achieving what they want to achieve. So, uh, I would say, uh, the, the situation that you describe tells me that there is there is no proper strategy in place, uh, and, and, and and one needs to achieve that. But it is a bigger job in an organisation like that, an existing organisation, because you first have to work with the people. You first have to to achieve a, a, a company culture. You know, we talked about. Uh, develop a strategy support of culture. 
you, you, you sit with a problem that the culture is not conducive to a proper strategy. Not, not because the people are negative about it necessarily, but maybe because they've seen this too many times. They've seen initiatives too many times. Uh, so, so sometimes you have to work on it for a year, two years, before you can really get to a proper culture, or a proper strategy. Uh, because of this culture problem. Because you have to get this culture out of the way, not out of the way in the sense that there must be a culture, you must improve the culture. Uh, and, and you must get people to a position where they believe that we need a proper strategy. We cannot work without it. Second one, the second uh, step, strategy implementation. Uh, and we specifically said that, uh, yeah, well, we have what is necessary. So, let me not try and over, and do that over. I think that will make sense. Uh, right. So, the third step, the th uh, strategy evaluation, is the final stage in strategic management. So, the evaluation of your strategy. Uh, managers desperately need to know when particular strategies are not working well. Strategy evaluation is the primary means for obtaining this information. So we evaluate so, we, so, we, so that we know whether it works well or whether it does not work well. So we say that we have three strat fundamental strategy evaluation activities. Uh, the first is reviewing external and internal factors that are the bases for current strategies. In other words, go back and go and ask yourself, well, why did we have this strategy? Why do we have this strategy? And you will then find that there were certain external and certain internal factors that were the bases for, for these strategies. And now you review that. You say, well, uh, there's, there's, there's two things. The one is I then understand why I have this strategy, and I can also evaluate whether this strategy was maybe completely in place, whether, whether it was correct what I, what I strategized. Uh, this, the second activity is to measure performance, to see how I perform based on that strategy and then take corrective action yeah, if, if that is necessary. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll just now come to, to more uh, concrete stuff that will help us in this process. We say strategy formulation, implementation, evaluation activities occur at three hierarchical levels in, a, in an large organization. It, it happens at corporate level, at divisional level, at the functional level. Now, I make the functional level red because that is what we are interested in. We are looking at the function, the function of maintenance. Uh, we say that smaller businesses may only have the corporate and the functional levels. In other words, it's maybe there's not uh, something as big as corporate and divisional and so on. But there might, might be one of those levels missing. So let's then go on from this. That was then sort of as a background to maintenance models. Now we get to the terror technology model. Terror technology model, uh, which is a model that is, is fairly well known in the maintenance world. We say that until the late 60s, no serious thought. No, no, sorry, I'm pressing on the wrong thing. Until the late 60s, no serious thought was given to the conceptualization of the maintenance function. In other words, people thought of, of maintenance as being a very basic function. They thought they understood it exactly, and they never thought about it. In, in, in higher terms, sort of. We say, but the practice of maintenance provided cause for concern. 
Now you have a reference there to the to page 33 of the maintenance text. Uh, maintenance costs were on the rise and the service availability of the systems being maintained was unacceptably low. Slowly but surely the maintenance function grew in importance in boardrooms and in the minds of decision makers. One of the consequences of this opinion shift was the large scale survey commissioned in the late 1960s by the British Ministry of, of Technology. So they sort of asked themselves, they said, well, what, what happens here is we see we have a technological base, uh, and that was now in, in Britain. We have a technological base, and this technological base is performing certain things for us, or, or producing certain things for us, but what we're also seeing is that it is costing us a lot uh, to, to, to keep it up, and uh, the cost that we are spending, we are not sure that we're getting value for that. So that was the idea. That was the problem. So, so what they did is they then uh, commissioned uh, uh, a, a commission, they, they, they put up a commission of inquiry into this to find out what is going on. And the findings of the report that this, uh, that this uh, commission uh, table said that maintenance was costing the United Kingdom some 3,000 million pounds per annum at, at that stage. Now you can think, if you, if you think from the 60s up to today, how much it would have been today at that amount. Production savings, they said that production savings of around 200 to 300 million pounds per annum could be affected through very basic improvements in maintenance. That's what they found. So they said very basic improvements could bring that to us. So they were talking about near, near to 10% could be saved. They proposed that the maintenance of a technical system should be seen in its larger context. Uh, that larger context then meaning the life cycle of the equipment. So they said that one should, one should understand the maintenance of a piece of equipment in terms of the life cycle of that piece of equipment. Which makes sense to, to, a, to an engineer. Uh, but they said that that life cycle must be understood as starting at conceptualization, not not only when we get the piece of equipment and have to maintain it, but starting at conceptualization, when somebody has this concept in his mind that there should be a piece of equipment like this. That conceptualization and specification and design of the, of the equipment and ending at the disposal of the system. So they said we must really look at the whole life cycle and we must understand the, the part that we maintain the piece of equipment, we must understand that in that full context. And they then proposed, uh, they, or they named it, they proposed wider approach, or they suggested that it should be named Terry Technology. Now, the, the, uh, uh, the Greek word terror, Greek word, word terror means to, to keep up. To, to, to maintain sort of. So, the, so that, that is sort of maintenance technology. Uh, the word, that word has stuck in maintenance and has not stuck in maintenance. In the sense that it has stuck in maintenance in the sense that if you go and do a search on terror technology on the web, you will find many, 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 many you will find that there's a lot of references. And that you will find websites like www.technology.com, etc., etc. You will just find them. Uh, so, so it has stuck in a certain sense. But in another sense, when you ask most maintenance people what is their technology, they uh, have an inkling what you're talking about. They just don't know about it. It's not, not something that 
not something that they worry about. Let's say. Now, Terra Technology, there's the, uh, the life cycle of a piece of equipment, the design of the equipment. Of course, even before that, we said conceptualization, we've not included that in that in this picture. Uh, but the design of the equipment and then to, to establish technical specifications that the person that wants to buy it into, a, into an organization, uh, establish specifications for what he wants, and then eventually the equipment is chosen, procured, installed, commissioned, and then operated and maintained and eventually replaced. Uh, so this is the, the whole life cycle that they had in mind. Uh, the one thing that I felt very strongly about and which uh, makes a lot of sense is that they said that there should be feedback to the designer regarding uh, installation and commissioning experiences and also regarding operating and maintenance experiences so that the designs in time could progress based on actual experience. Uh, even even uh, feedback regarding uh, replacement, if, if that is relevant. But feedback should play a big role. And uh, that, that feedback was then dubbed teletechnological feedback. The second model that we want to look at is the EUT model. Now, EUT stands for Antwerpen University of Technology model. Uh, we say that the technology model was lacking in many areas. Uh, and we, we, we named one or two of them. One of the major problems was that its focus was on the larger context. In other words, the whole life cycle, which was correct but neglected the processes inside the maintenance organization itself. You know, uh, probably if you have an, an, an adherent of, of the technology approach, they will say, no, 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 that is not so. But in practice, that is what happened. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the big reasons why maintenance people just did not take up the approach, because they, they, they accept the idea that you must look at the whole life cycle but they cannot see that the life cycle must sort of become the 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 the, the, or the, 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 the whole business of maintenance must be defined only by the life cycle. They will immediately get to grips with you and say, "Well, no, 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 no that that cannot be," because the, what the what, what that commission of inquiry, the technology commission of inquiry, what they suggested is they suggested that the maintenance department in a typical organization be replaced by a technology <coughs> department, which then manage this whole process, this whole uh, wider process. Uh, now, I must say, at the same time, I must say that uh, that is sort of coming in being now uh, with the advent of, of uh, also a British thing that happened in the, in the last 10 years or so is they developed a standard for maintenance uh, or, or for, for what is today called asset, asset management. Now asset management means that you exactly have what the technology approach suggested, a wider approach. You look at the whole life cycle, but also asset management also includes the idea that you even have to manage the asset in terms of its role in, the, in production. So you have to manage the asset, asset in total, its, its capital value, its, its uh, whole life cycle from, from uh, conceptualization to, to the grave. Uh, and, and, and also its, its production function. Uh, so asset management has, has now become the, the, the buzzword. Today people don't talk about maintenance anymore. They talk about asset management. Uh, and, and the British then brought a standard into being called PAS. Uh, 
uh, 66. Uh, now, PAS 66 is then the, the, the asset management standard for 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 for, 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 for the United Kingdom and for adherents of the United Kingdom. South Africa, somewhat there's some movement towards that. There was some movement, but not much. Uh, and then the international community became and they came and they set up a new standard called ISO 66000. So you can see the PAS 66 and now ISO 66000. You can see that they are sort of related to one another. That the, the United Kingdom played a big role in that. Uh, also Australia, South Africa had a part in that, Canada and so on. So ISO 66000 is now the standard in the asset management world. Uh, so, and again, that looks at maintenance in quite a wide context. Uh, now at that stage, we're now talking the late 60s when the uh, technology model was, was uh, prevalent. Uh, the Eindhoven University of Technology started the process uh, whereby they said, well, in, 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 in the Netherlands, we need some teaching in, in maintenance engineering. I, I, in actual fact, they call it maintenance management. We, we need an, an, uh, teaching in maintenance management. And they set aside a uh, maintenance practitioner who was an, an, uh, quite a high-ranking officer in, in the uh, Royal Dutch Navy. And they set him aside at Eindhoven University of Technology and they said, you please teach maintenance management. Now that was uh, Professor Bill Gerrard, really quite a, quite a well-known man. And Professor Bill Gerrard uh, saw this limitation, that's what we say. Uh, and he, this limitation that the Workings inside the organization has been injected in the technology model. So what he did is he concentrated his effort more on the outer processes, uh, outer inner processes of the business organization. Uh, and then devised what has become known as the EUT maintenance model. It's a descriptive model. They, they, they accentuated that quite well to say, well, it's a descriptive model which describes how maintenance processes work rather than a prescriptive model that prescribes how it should work. In other words, it, it, it did not say, you know, the, the uh, technology model was to a certain extent a prescriptive model. Because they said maintenance does not work now, it does not work well, so let us rather change its extent, its, 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 its focus, its, uh, its uh, what's the word now? Uh, yeah, I can't get the word now. It's a, it's a very silly word, a very, very basic word. Uh, the omfang? Scope. Scope. <laughs> Let's change the scope of this whole thing. That's what, what the Terra Technology said. Uh, now, Bill Gerrards and Key said, well, in terms of the EUT model, we don't want to do that. We want to describe exactly how things work in a typical organization. And they came up with this model. Now this, this, I must say, is, is my simplification of the model. So the model is a little bit more involved, but I think it has all, all the uh, basic stuff that, that was in the, the EMT model included. So you see at the bottom here, it talks about the technological feedback. Uh, this block here, this block here represents the organization. 
So what they said is they said, well, let's take the message of technology and let's say we must start at the design. We agree with that. I think any maintenance person will agree to that principle. That one has to, to start by looking at the design and make sure that the design is such that this piece of equipment is really well maintainable. That's very important. Uh, secondly, we, we must then also include the manufacturing process and, and the one thing before we get the piece of equipment into our organization, we must develop a maintenance plan for that, for that thing. We must know how are we going to maintain it. That must be part of parcel of, of uh, what we get. We don't only get a piece of equipment, but we also get a maintenance plan for it. Now, to a certain extent, that was true for most pieces of equipment. Most pieces of equipment had some guidelines as to how you grease it and how you uh, set to certain settings and so on. But it was very basic stuff. So what this thing now said is it said that there should be a proper maintenance plan. There should be the best thing that you can get given that the piece of equipment probably, most probably is a new piece of equipment. There's not much experience and so on. There are limitations, but within those limitations we must do the best that we can. Uh, those of you that did the maintenance logistics as a subject area will know we talk of a maintenance concept. Now, what, what they really had here was a maintenance concept. So they said that you must have a maintenance concept. Uh, Will Gerrards did not like it at all that I put in the maintenance plan in here because he's, he said I did not understand what is the difference between the concept and the plan. And I think he was, to a large extent, he was correct. Uh, at that stage when I drew, drew this drawing, I did not understand the, the difference that well. But nevertheless, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the fact is that you need a plan before you get the piece of equipment into, into your organization. Uh, now, when you add it to your organization, what, what the accent of this uh, EUT model was, was to say, well, maintenance management has a job. Their job is that each piece of equipment that comes into the organization poses a certain maintenance demand on the, on the organization. And of course, all the pieces of equipment that's in the organization poses such a demand. So you have a, 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 an aggregated demand on the organization regarding what is necessary in terms of maintenance based on the maintenance plans of these various pieces of equipment. And then they said, well, the, the way in which they resolve this is by, by, by balancing the demand with the correct capacity of maintenance capacity, the capacity to do maintenance, to maintain the, the equipment. And they said, well, and you have four types of capacity. Internally, you have your own internal maintenance capacity, your maintenance department's capacity to do maintenance. But you can also make use of some operator maintenance. So you can also utilize that capacity, depending, of course, on how, to what extent that, what that is developed is. Um, so, so in a in a trucking company, your operator's maintenance would obviously be like, like the driver topping up the engine oil, yes. and then your internal capacity would then be like your mechanic doing exactly. a service replacing blokes exactly. and stuff like that. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, and there might be uh, so, uh, parts of your management might be devoted to to improving the ways of maintaining. Uh, so that's also a sort of capacity so that I'm talking yeah. about, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then you have your original equipment manufacturer support, so your equipment manufacturer can supply some, some maintenance capacity to you. And also you can maybe hire in external capacity, especially so with big plants when you have shutdowns and so on, then you get capacity from the outside to, to assist. So, 
So the, the job they then said that maintenance management was bad, balanced demand against capacity. And then they said that there are cer certain things that are critical to the success of maintenance, and that is good spare parts control and good uh, rotables control, where a rotable is a, is a unit that sits in a, in a machine or in a plant or whatever, and that can be taken out when it, when it stops working, it can be taken out and it can be sent away either to, to internal workshop or to out, outside workshops for repair and it can be brought back and it can be put into in stock again and it can be reused. So that is called a rotable. So, so it, it rotates. It's uh, sometimes called a, a reconditionable unit by some organizations. It's, uh, uh, and uh, in some organizations, such rotables are controlled to such an extent that the rotable has a unique identification, a unique number, such that you can, over time, track that rotable and see where it has worked in, in different circumstances, what its life was in certain circumstances, and, so, and, and, it, and its costs, and that, so on. Okay. So, Yes. About the external capacity and the OEM support, uh, this uh, it, it, com it comes back to the debate of whether you want to outsource your maintenance or you want to do it internally. And often you find that the external com the external companies and the OEM do hold the let's say the parent company uh, to somehow to some uh, how can I say what what's the word? Hostage, then in that way. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. In that, they, 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 they keep all this information and skills to themselves. So, in such a way that the company cannot operate without them. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be best if maybe we could find some maintenance model where we can limit such uh, the external companies having so much influence in, in the. Okay. In the let me just say that uh, what they had in mind here with external capacity was not outsourcing. At that stage, I don't think outsourcing was that, in, that much of, a, of an issue. Uh, most organizations maintain only with inside capacity, but make use of external capacity in terms of contract, more kind of contract labor in, uh, in, in, in certain situations. And of course, in certain specialized cases where, where a, a, a specific machine you did not have the expertise in, in house, so you made use of external capacity in terms of that you send it away to, to somebody outside to help you with, with this, which, which is not an, an original equipment manufacturer, but it is maybe has a reconditioning uh, workshop that, that they do specialized reconditioning for instance. So, the, the issue that you're talking about is a relevant issue. I think we, uh, I think uh, you must just keep that back because we're coming to the issue of, of uh, outsourcing. Uh, but, but in terms of this picture here, uh, at, at the stage when it was devised, I don't think they had outsourcing in mind there, although outsourcing can also fit in there. So, but, but I think whether you, you make use to, of external capacity to such an extent that it is negative for you or not is, is again one of the, of the issues, the, ma the management issues that they had in mind. In other words, you, the, the management must make those, those decisions. So I, I don't think they, they said at this stage with this thing, that, one, uh, that they want to propose outsourcing or they want to propose this or that. They just wanted to explain how, how management works in a typical maintenance organization. Okay, uh, so we talked about spare parts control and about rotables control. And then they said, well, as management does this whole thing, this uh, capacity, uh, management thing. As they do this, and as they uh, take cognizance of the importance of, 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 of these facets, 
they must then evaluate what are the results that they are achieving in terms of their maintenance. And they must then use that for uh, one thing that they must do, thinking back to the uh, control model, they must sort of generate feedback from that. In other words, they measure sort of as they evaluate, they measure, they uh, feedback and they then base so exactly like we discussed. And they also provide better technological feedback to the designer. So that was the idea of the of the EMT model. So we say that the EMT model is a marked improvement on the technological model, uh, as it explains much more of the of the inner processes. And if we say a marked improvement on the technology model. We're not saying that the Terra technology model was not the great beginning that it was, because it was. I mean, it was a total different thinking. Whether it was absolutely correct doesn't matter. The fact is that they identified the importance of thinking about the whole life cycle. However, this EUT model still does not explain the processes inside the maintenance organization world. In other words, in that block maintenance management, that block, uh, we say that what is necessary is a model to explain the processes inside the block name maintenance management in the figure. So we need something like that. I must just say something uh, regarding uh, the background of the EUT model. When, when uh, Professor Will Gerhardt uh, was taken out of the Navy and was put into the, the end of the University of Technology and said, well, you must now please teach uh, maintenance. He, he had a crisis in the sense that he knew a lot of stuff regarding maintenance because he was a maintenance man and a fairly senior maintenance man. But the moment that you have to teach, you have to ask yourself, well, what do I now have to teach these people? What, what are the, what's the content? What, what should the structure of the subject is? and so on be? And it's not so easy. It's not so easy. So one of the reasons why he devised the EMT model was to first understand for himself how did he understand the whole context and also to explain to other people, well, why is it that he wants to propose certain, certain avenues towards teaching. Okay, so, so it was a teaching tool as well. Very important uh, part of, 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 of his thinking. Now, we have another one, Beagles' model. Uh, we say that the functional view of the maintenance department was proposed by Beagle in 1972. That was a German guy. His model was in very many respects uh, based on a modification of traditional plant maintenance. So, uh, the, the source where, we, where I got it from is maintenance and management by Anthony. Kelly, who's a well-known author in the maintenance field. Uh, he's at the University of Manchester. Uh, so, so he, uh, one of the models that he lists in, in that book of his is, is the Vigo model. Now, uh, it's, it's a completely different thing. Whereas the technology model and also the EFT model was more of macro models, uh, the Vigo model is a very much a uh, process inside the organization. The, how do you practice plant maintenance in an organization? But it, it is also a, a model that explains certain things to us. You must uh, please excuse the, the, the uh, print is not that well, uh, not that good. Uh, I was looking for a better one yesterday, but I could not find one. Time, I, I, I hope that I will find a better quality. Uh, but one can get the idea. Uh, what he said is uh, he, he, he sort of said, Well, this whole thing concerns planning the control. Uh, and he had certain quadrants that he thought of here. Uh, Plant servicing and inspection in this quadrant here, in, in this half here, plant repair, 
and in that one cost analysis. So what he said is he said, well, what, what one needs, and, and again you have the idea of a cycle, so uh, the control model type, type of thing, you have a sort of a cycle. Uh, so he said, well, you, you analyze cost, you analyze cost, based on that you, you decide on certain action, so you plan certain work that must be done, uh, and, and, and that includes two types of things, the normal things that you, uh, that, that you do, you, you, you plan certain things, for instance, in here you have inspection planning and inspection, and, and based on the inspection you will have a damage report, which you then have to plan, and you have to decide what working methods are you going to use, what time, what time is involved, you place orders for, for that, uh, that, that's uh, orders for, for materials, but also the orders for the work to be done, work orders, uh, and you prepare the site and you do the repair, and then you have the cost effect of that, that cost effect goes into data processing, uh, and that cost is the center of, I don't know what, something, and you analyze the cost and you go around again. But the other aspect that you have is this aspect here, where you have improvements, improvement pro proposals with documents for plan changes uh, from the design office, also based on your cost analysis, so you've decided, well, certain things are too expensive, certain things we can improve, and thus you go to the design office and you sort of initiate new designs, and you use those new designs, and you, and you sort of, again, plan the work, and the work is done, and so on. So that was Vigonsen's model. Very much a, a process, very much an engineering-centered process. Uh, whereas we tend to, in time, we tend to, in maintenance, move more and more towards a management center process, a, a people management center process, as opposed to a, a, a pure engineering process. That's not to say that the engineering is not there, but what, 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 what this means is it says that, that everything is a physical thing that must take place. It has not and it, it does not look at the, the people management aspects of, 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 of the thing. So we say Wiggles' model is much more of a process flowchart than a strategic management model. As such, it addresses the process of workflow rather than the management processes that will lead to success. So it does not, it does not have the, 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 the higher view of, of maintenance is more just the work that must be done. Uh, and there are still, even today, there are many people that think like that. Uh, and if you, if, you, if, you, if you do that with high intensity, that type of process, and if you manage a process like that well, and you do it with high intensity, you can get some success. Uh, the problem is that it is not normally not sustainable success. It is, it is uh, the, the success sits in certain personalities in the organization who drives it. The moment that those personalities fall away, the organization has trouble. And that's why you need to look at a more strategic management of, of the maintenance function. 